This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the LA 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming a former child star of the 80s, and I'm talking about Danny Corkill. Danny uh, played the lost little boy Alex Selke in the 1983 melodrama Without a Trace. And then um, he went on to play Turtle in the underrated sci-fi classic Daryl. He'll be my second guest from that movie, because I interviewed the associate producer a few years ago. Uh, he was also in David Lynch's Dune. He was in Rocket Gibraltar. Did some TV things here and there. Uh, was in the Mel Gibson movie Mrs. Sofal. Then he got out of the business. We'll to find out what he what he's doing now. And it's going to be a great talk today. I love finding people who haven't been found. People who don't mind being found. You know, I love talking to people who left the business It's such a refreshing conversation instead of the, you know, it's about me trip. And I am so excited for this today. So yeah, here is my interview with Dan Corkle. Hey Dan, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm great, Tommy. Thanks for having me. How are you? Absolutely. This is such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Talk about the olden days. <laughs> yeah. Further away every day, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, going back in time, what age did you start gravitating toward acting? Oh, gosh. Um, that was the way my mom tells it. Um, I think when I was four years old, I told her I was going to be a movie star. <laughs> and uh, she she laughed and she patted me on the head. You know, that's, that's, that's nice, Danny. Um, and I guess I bugged her about it for a while. And that one day there was... An ad in the paper, open cast call, you know, mm-hmm. national casting call, any male between the years of 8 and 10, you know, who can, uh, who can read well, come down audition. And uh, she thought, you know what, this is a great opportunity to show how tough it is to get acting, maybe shut him up a little bit. Um, but if he loves it, you know, he can have the rejection a few times, maybe we'll try to find him an agent. And uh, it totally screwed her up because that way I got the job and that's how it started. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if it was only that simple now. Um... <sighs> So your so your parents weren't in the business then. I'm sorry, what was that again? So your your parents weren't in the business then. No, no, totally no. This was I, I had no connections whatsoever. This was simply uh, supposed to be a day adventure with my mom. You know, to take me mm. out of school. We take the train. I was in the suburbs of Chicago at the time, so I wasn't in L.A. or New York. Um, so I didn't have any exposure to the scene there. Um, this was simply a, a chance to give the kid a different sort of day. Um, and it turned into, you know, probably five, six years of really life-altering experiences. So it was, uh, it was, it was, it was a great time. Yeah, was was it a commercial? No, it was, um, it was for without a trace of all things. Oh, okay. So, it was, so you just, you know, started at the top there. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's funny. Um, I, I went into the audition, and you know, obviously, I had no experience whatsoever. Um, and there's, you know, hundred, couple hundred kids there, whatever it is, and mm-hmm. I'm just waiting my turn. And they, they called me in there, and you know, it's, it's you're, you're talking to seven, eight year olds. You know, I mean, they're just trying mm-hmm. to get a feel for your personality. You know, what do you like? Can you read well? Things like that. You know, they, they didn't even give you sides or anything like that at the time. Um, and I'll never forget. They asked me to tell a joke, and at eight years old, man, I knew every knock knock joke in the books, mm-hmm. and I totally blanked. And I, and I tell people this all the time. I, you know, I'm not. I'm really not a big fake guy. I'm really not. Um, yeah. But uh, they asked me to tell a joke, oh. and for some reason, at that exact moment in time, the only joke I could remember was a joke I'd overheard my father telling two years before at a party, word for word, a story joke. And uh, I, I told them flat out, I said, you know, I can't remember any except for a dirty joke. Yeah. And they kind of looked at me, and they said, they said well, how dirty is it? You know, is it real dirty? So I said, well, it's just a little dirty. We'll tell the joke. And I told a dirty joke, mm-hmm. and they almost fell off their chairs laughing, because I'm sure I'm the only eight-year-old who walked in there and told a dirty joke that day. Um, and to this day, I, I have no doubt that it's one of the things that helped me stand out that day and got their, got their attention or nothing else. Yeah. So, do, do, yeah. You, do you remember what the joke was? <laughs> I, I, I do. I could tell you the joke if you really want me to. I mean, it'll oh, yeah. be hated for anyone who didn't grow up in the 80s. 
Um, and, and you have to remember my dad was uh, an electrician who grew up working gas stations, but I'm happy to tell you the joke if you want to hear it. Absolutely. Go ahead. Oh, gosh. Okay. Um, a couple Martians are orbiting Earth, and it's their job to gather as much data on humans as they can, you know, before the inevitable meeting. Yeah. Um, but their, their equipment isn't working right, and they're, they're having trouble getting, getting the, the, the stuff they need. And all they're getting these fuzzy TV pictures that show humans are roughly, you know, five and a half, six feet tall. Mm-hmm. And before they get anything fixed, they get the message, you know, go down, meet the leaders of Earth. So they end up landing outside a gas station, you know, the middle of nowhere, 3 o'clock in the morning, there's just nothing moving. And the first Martian hops out of his saucer, looks around, first thing he sees is a gas pump. It's about five and a half, six feet tall, must be human. Yeah. Walks over and says, take me your leader. Gas pump doesn't say anything. Take me your leader. Gas pump still doesn't say anything. It's okay, fine. If you don't take me your leader, by the time I count to three, I'm going to blow you to bits. One, two, three. Pulls out his phaser, blows up the one gas pump, sets off the chain reaction, all the, the whole gas station goes up in a ball of flames. Mm. His friend in the saucer hears all the commotion, pokes his head out, sees his friend laying in the dust over there, walks over, picks him up, dusts him off, says, what the heck happened to you? He says, man, I don't know. He goes, but I did learn one thing about Earth. He says, what's that? He says, never screw around with a guy who can stick his dick in his ear. <laughs> I love it. Like, if you really want to go back and think about this, I mean, first off, that coming out of the mouth of an eight-year-old had to be hysterical. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but, I mean, if I really want to get into it, I mean, that is, it's a story joke. It's memorization. It's timing. It's a punchline. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, there mm-hmm. was so much there that had to help me stand out against whatever was that. The fact that I can't remember all the silly jokes I could tell my friends, but I can pull that one out mm-hmm. at that exact moment is, is just crazy. Just crazy. Yeah, no, that's so awesome. So, you won them over at the audition, and uh, do, do you know if your parents had any reluctance uh, for you to be involved in the screenplay? Because at that time, you know, the whole Adam Walsh thing was going on, and you know, I'm sure that there was a little, there was a little bit yeah, of, you know, I sadness. Think so. I think it was. I, I think you know, we were all. I mean, it was like a whirlwind. I mean, it was crazy. Um, I think I was originally auditioning for the part of the detective son mm-hmm. um, uh, in that movie that went to, gosh, was it David? David, I think his name was. David, I think I think his name was David. It's been a long time. David Simon. Um, David Simon, yeah. David Simon would be the winner. Um, and uh, the, the way I understand the story, like I ran into Beth Gutchen, um, who wrote the book that the movie was based on. It was called Still Missing at the time. Right. Um, and I ran into her uh, at a book signing 20 years later, 30 years later, whatever it was. And the way she tells the story is they were, you know, Stanley Jaffe, the director, was, was not determined to cast a, a new kid for this part. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were really frustrated because they were looking all over the country and they could not get anything right. And she remember being like in his office and they were kind of beating their heads against the wall when they got the call from Chicago. And so we have a boy, you know, it was just such a moment of excitement for them and for everybody else. And they brought me back for like one call back the next day, um, which we had to reschedule because it was going against our school variety show where I was playing Ronald McDonald in a sketch. I was not the lead, it was an off part in a sketch. Mm. And uh, they flew me to New York and I was screen testing with Kate Nelly on the director and that's a whole other story. And the next thing I know, I was signed to contracts for both parts and they just said, we'll tear up the other contract whenever we find another boy we like for one of these other parts. So it was fast. And so I don't even think we had a whole lot of time to process like what a life-changing thing this was going to be. Um, it just happened and you kind of, you know, how can you say no to an opportunity like that? You know, if your kid's excited about it, you know, the, mm-hmm. your parents will find a way to make it work. And I was blessed with parents who found a way to make it work. So it was, it was, it was a really great experience all the way through. Yeah. So you're doing the uh, audition process with Kate and Elligan. Was there other kids there? <sighs> At that one, I don't, I only I don't remember other kids there, but I mean, gosh, it was so long ago now. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm pretty. I feel like I. I feel like that day, I. I was the only one that I saw. Um, if you. If you're familiar with the movie, do you remember the scene uh, at breakfast where I'm feeding my eggs to the dog? Yes. Um, so that was the scene we were we were working on, um, and it was funny because at the t- eight years old, I was a picky eater and I hated scrambled eggs. Yeah. So as we sat down to do the screen test, there's a plate of cold scrambled eggs in front of me that have been there for part of the day now. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I mentioned them. I said, this is great. This is actually going to work really well because I don't like eating eggs. Feeding them to an animal will work out fantastically. And we all had a good laugh. And 
Keaton Elgin looked at me when we were done, and she goes, oh, come on, I don't know any eight-year-old boys who don't eat eggs, so you, you, can you just try a bite for me? And I know at eight years old, this is not going to go well. You know what I mean? I know what my reaction is going to be. And I kind of look, I said, I really don't think I should. And she goes, oh, come on, for me, and you're eight at the start of the movie, it's your first screen test, it's a big deal. You're going to take a bite of the eggs, because you have to. Mm -hmm. um, and so I took a bite of the eggs, and then I probably gagged on the taste and the texture and spit them back <laughs> out of the plate. And all I remember is walking down the hall after that was over and watching Kate running down the hall ahead of me to get to my mother to apologize before I could get there. <laughs> 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 she was so horrified at my reaction and gagging that she made me do it. It was like, and I was fine. I mean, I knew it was going to happen. It wasn't a big deal. But I still, to this day, I can remember watching Kate running ahead of me because she was felt so terrible about it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Kate Nelligan is such a talented actress, and people have told me she's uh, tough as nails and doesn't suffer fools. How was working with her? Oh, oh my God, it was it was wonderful. I mean, you know, Kate is a, um, I mean, she's she's hardcore, right? And mm -hmm. and so if she's going to play my mom, she was like my mom. Yeah. You know, um, and we had a wonderful relationship um, to the point where you know when the movie was over, um, I went out and visited her for like two weeks. Um, you know, well after shooting had been done, and stayed with her in uh, in her apartment in New York for uh, however many days it was, and then out at a house in Connecticut on the beach for another period of time, um, just because we were so close. So I actually flew to New York by myself at eight or nine years old, however old I was. Mm -hmm. They uh, they mixed up the pickup time, so I was there in the in the airport by myself for a while. I mean, under the airports under the airline supervision, of course, but uh, there was a horrifying moment for everybody involved. Uh, <laughs> but it was great. I mean, she was she was could not have been better to me um, on the set or afterwards or anything else. She was really wonderful. Yeah, she was coming off of Frank Langella's Dracula, and you know um, she was hot at that point. You know, yep. And uh, I guess the, I the needle was another one she did back then. That was with Dal Dal Sutherland. I want to say. Right. Right. Yep. How was working with Judd Hirsch? Um, John was great. You know, he, I mean, it wasn't as as I, close a relationship as I had with Kate, but he was always really nice to me. He was. He, I have an autograph book that I kept from uh, from all the movies I did, where I mean, everybody signed it. Everyone involved in the production it wasn't just cast. Um, he had a very nice autograph in there. Um, he was very supportive of me. You know, helped me out in a lot of ways. Really made me comfortable with everything we did. Um, so he was great. I mean, it was it, without trace was really was one of my two favorite experiences while I was working. Everybody involved was, was so supportive. Everybody was so nice. It was such a low-pressure environment. You know, I was trying to think back to things I remember, um, you know, from that shoot. And, you know, I, I'll never forget, you know, the first day working, I mean, I just showed up and went to work. There was no rehearsal. There was no nothing. It was the scene where I woke up in bed. Mm -hmm. Nobody made a big deal about it. Um, I just was laying there, and, you know, we, we did the first scene, and nobody complained. So I was like, okay, I guess I'm doing this right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, one thing I remember the most is that after after Judd rescues you, you're in the back seat with his with his son David Simon, yep. and yep. you you give him this look like he's a weird kid, <laughs> and it's perfect because this movie is pretty much depressing. But in this heartwarming moment of of discovering Alex is alive and coming home, it brings humor to the situation. It's, it's funny because I go back and it's it's like. So being there, there was actually, originally in the script, there was a whole conversation there mm -hmm. where I sort of explain what happened and how I was taken type thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in the in the end, I think they made the right choice in getting rid of it. Um, not because it was, you know, maybe I was terrible. Maybe that's why they heard it. I don't know. Um, but I, I think having the kids sort of explain what happened, to, you know, off screen throughout the whole movie, I don't think it was that important. It was just important that he was going home. You know what I mean? And the... You know, I, I don't I don't wax poetic about any work I've done or movies I was involved with, you know, very often. Uh, um, but I love the ending of that movie. I love the music. I love the conversations between the police officers. Um, um, I think it was just the right amount of, you know, communication and lack of communication between, you know, Judd, myself, and David and all that. Um, it's just, it's a really, it, it's a very nicely done emotional day. Somebody sent me something on TikTok the other day, apparently, it's some sort of, you know, TikTok sensation as far as the, 
people's favorite endings ever made to a movie type thing. Um, I don't have TikTok, so I only see the clips. Um, yeah. But uh, it was great. I, I, was, I was really happy with the way that turned out. Stanley Joffe, of course, has produced many legendary films like Fatal Attraction, but this is the only movie he directed. What was he like as a director? He was he was wonderful. I mean, uh, he was totally supportive, totally nice. Uh, you know, it's funny. It's, uh, the, the only re- reaction I have, uh, the, one, one, uh, not the only, I shouldn't say that, that one of the, the, the strongest memories I have of him directing me um, was I probably made him very, very frustrated because I just, you know, every now and again you get a little bit of brain lock in whatever you're doing. And uh, the scene at the end of the movie where we're crawling out of the car as, during, uh, as they return me home and are getting out of the car on the street, there was that big crowd. Mm. It was comfortable, comfortable for me just to get out there with my arms crossed, which sets sort of a standoffish sort of tone, you know, for the scene and the bad body language, which I totally get now. And so, you know, Asked me not to cross the arms. I must have did it ten more times after that. <laughs> you know, just, I yeah. get out of the car. And I'm like, yep, I did again. Okay, back in there again. But I mean, never like, you know, playfully chastising me for it. Never, never in a bad way. And um, mm-hmm. like I said, it was, it was uh, just, you know, I, 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 I say this, and I'll, I'm sure I'll say it more than once today. Um, you know that I. I I, I interact a little bit with people who used to be actors, you know, as, as children, um, and I, you read all the stories, and, yeah. and so many people who take away some sort of, you know, negative experience with it, or sort of mixed emotions about it, or anything else, and, and mine could not have been more positive. You know, even if, even if every movie I did, I didn't, you know, absolutely love working on the same way I did without a trace, or, or Daryl. Mm-hmm. Um, the people involved were just so nice and supportive of me and my family that um, I, I consider myself extraordinarily fortunate to this day to everything I got to do. I know, I've talked to a lot of kid actors, you know, and so many of them are screwed up, you know, it's sad, but um, I know you sound very well adjusted, so I'm glad about that. Um, William H. Macy, this is one of his first movies, he plays a reporter in the movie. That's funny, that's true, I didn't even make that connection, my gosh, there's, and you go back and there's so many, like, people who became really big names and little tiny parts of something you did or whatever else, that just makes you laugh, like, you know, David Hyde Pierce and Rocket Gibraltar is the is the French chef. You know what I mean? Oh, oh my yeah. gosh, who knew? You know what I mean? Out of all the people in that cast, I mean, as talented as that cast was, I mean, he was going to be the one to blow up the way he did. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I know it's great to watch that. It's great. Yeah. The, then you did um, American Playhouse, A Matter of Principle, uh, with Alan yep. Arkin. What was that like? Yep. Um, different... Uh, different vibe, you know, uh, more intimate shoot. I mean, there were a lot of kids in the movie. It's funny, um, Virginia Madsen was in that, um, and she and I, both our very next project was Dune. So going from, you know, the little intimate production in a small town in Illinois, like a matter mm-hmm. of principle to Dune, it was kind of crazy. Um, Alan was great. I didn't have a huge part in it. My character didn't have a name. I was there under the, the character's title was Cousin Laura's Boy. Mm. Um, shows you how important I was to the overall arc of the story. Uh, but I remember sitting in, you know, sitting in between shots on arc, and it was a Christmas themed movie. Um, uh, and we would, we would sit together and play a game where we would try to come up with an actual name for my character based on the Cousin Laura's Boy initial CLB. So, you know, he spent some time making sure I still felt like uh, I was an important part of the crew there, which was nice. Yeah, it was a good cast. Gary Cole, Virginia Madsen, Cinnamon Idols. I've been trying to get her oh, on for a long time. I hope I get her soon. She was she was a lot of fun. She was really nice. I, I ran to her on a lot of different occasions, and she was always a wonderful kid. Yeah, I remember her from Kidco. Yes, 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 yes. And, uh, God, was, was Scotty Schwartz in that, too? Yeah, Scotty was in it. Yeah. 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 And I, I auditioned with him a few times, and it's, it's funny that the names you come across. Like, I can't remember him from the waiting room there. And I never worked <laughs> with him, but I know I came across a couple times at various auditions. I, I, you know, I, I, going back just for a second where you said um, my experience or no, my experience versus some of the other kids, I think being in Chicago and being removed from it all really helped. Yeah. You know, and the fact that I got in the way that I did, I mean, it was almost like, it was almost like we weren't supposed to be there. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, we did it because they let us do it and it was an honor and privilege and you, you go do it and you go home to Chicago. I flew to New York once or twice a month for auditions and I flew home. You know, it was fly in the morning, fly out at night, that thing. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think being in Chicago and being removed like that helped. And, and like a matter of principle, it was shot in a small town in Illinois. It was close to home. Um, again, small production, a little bit quicker, a um, little bit faster. Um, but a lot of fun. You know, a lot of kids in that movie, so it was, it was a different experience for me there. 
Yeah, Scotty was in New York, you know, when he made the the toy and Kid Co. and Christmas Story, mm -hmm. and you know, yep. and then he didn't move to L.A. till he was eighteen, and then he couldn't get arrested. You know. Yep. <laughs> Sad. It's hard, man, it's hard, you know. And for those kids, I guess we'll. I'm guessing we'll move on. We'll talk about it later. But yeah, I mean, uh, I I was a kid who, uh, you know, like I said, we, we we sort of couldn't believe we got the first movie we did. Mm -hmm. And then once you get that under your belt and it's received relatively well, you're not doing the cattle calls anymore. You're going in when they're down to five or six kids, so you can just sort of focus on the end part of the audition game. Um, and like I said, it was always it was always sort of like. We can't believe they let us in. Let's not screw this up. And if it ever gets to be not fun, we can stop. You know, which mm -hmm. is a, a great way for my parents to treat it. You know, there was never any pressure on me. It was just as long as it was good for me, as long as it was good for the family, then we'll keep doing this. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, after without a trace, I mean, it, in the matter of principle, you know, it was both really good experiences. So it, was, it was nice for everybody. Next comes David Lynch's Dune. Was that fun? You know, was, I'll say it was the only movie I never had to audition for. Mm -hmm. there's, my, there's my only brother, Dave Lynch, actually just called my agent and I was hired, which was great. I don't know if I had a line in the movie. Um, it, it, it was a hard shoot. Um, and it's funny, I look back on it now, and I was just talking to somebody about this uh, a few weeks ago. Um, I, I, in, in a lot of ways, I wish it hadn't been my second movie, my second big film. You know, mm -hmm. Matter of Principles is a much different production. Um, and I, you know, <laughs> excuse me, I wish that I um, recognized what a spectacle it was at the time. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, without having a lot of experience, you just thought, okay, you're making a movie and this is what you do, without realizing how different that was than the average movie-making experience. Um, so, but we, I got to go to Mexico for three months. They rented us a house in Cuernavaca. We had, you know, maids in the house. We had an indoor, we had, sorry, not indoor, we had an in-ground pool. Um, you know, it was great. I mean, the shoot was hard in a lot of ways. Um, a lot of standing around, a lot of... The set was always sort of rushed. I think they were always trying to catch up on things. And so many of the scenes I was involved in had so many people in them. Mm -hmm. There were always a ton of close-ups and a ton of angles and a ton of, you know, just repeating and repeating and repeating. Um, so it was a harder shoot than the other ones. It was a little more impersonal um, for everybody. But it doesn't mean that, you know, people still weren't wonderful. Everett McGill just a prince of a guy, Paul Smith. Um, another one that really stands out, Molly Ward, who played Tom McLaughlin, was, was great to me. Um, it was it was, it was was different, and like I said, I mean, I, 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 my only regret is that I wish I'd had some, something to compare it to in terms of the spectacle. I think I might have appreciated that aspect of it more than I did at the time. Uh, did, did you get to meet Sting or Max von Sydow or any of them? Um, I, I didn't spend any time with Max von Sydow, but it's funny, as I, I tell people now, I said I'm 48 years old, I have three children who are 14, 12, and 9, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I, I spent some time, you know, so when we did the Great Hall scene, Sting was in that scene, and I was there. Mm -hmm. And he spent a decent amount of time talking to a 9-year-old kid. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, that's, it might not seem like that big a deal, but as you get older and you have kids and you start interacting more with kids and having more conversations with kids, you know, I, I remember sitting there and my next door neighbor who was one of my idols growing up, um, he was a huge police fan. He was a musician. Um, mm -hmm. So I knew who Sting was and knew who the police were. Um, and so I would sit and talk to him and, and he would sit in between takes and we could have 20 minute conversations more than once, um, which is great. You know, I mean, he was, he was, really nice to me. Um, and like good. I said, I look back at it now and think, man, Sting took a lot of time talking to a nine-year-old kid. <laughs> 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 you know? When you're nine, you don't think anything of it because it's, it's just who you are, right? But as an adult, I, I appreciate it even more now um, that uh, I, I, was, I was never made to feel other. That's good. Yeah, David Lynch, I, I, he's been described as Jimmy Stewart from Mars. He's just a very odd guy, but yet so normal at the same time. Absolutely, um, and and he and he was all over that set, and like you know, where in some of the other work that I did, I had a lot more scenes that were you know with one other person or two other people, so you get a lot more intimate interaction with your director um, when this when you have less people that they're trying to direct in these madhouses, right? Mm -hmm. um, where most of my scenes were big crowd scenes and dude, I didn't have as many one-on-one -on -one interactions with David Lynch. Um, there's still, there was so much to manage in each of those scenes. Um, but he was, again, always great, always wonderful. I, I, I go back, I still, 
I, I tell the stories because it makes me laugh. Um, just to give you an idea of what some some of the craziness on the set was. Um, so my my brother in the movie, his name was Diego Gonzalez. He cast him out of a restaurant in El Salvador. I don't even know how they found him or anything else. Great kid. Um, mm-hmm. And at one point, they were preparing for you know the big battle scene with the Fremen, um, Harkonnen, and all that at the end of the movie. And they were going to have Diego and I involved in some of that battle. And so we had to learn how to night fight. And so they gave us each you know bone daggers and all that. They brought us over to you know whatever the break in the shoot, and they bring us over to the back corner. Mm-hmm. And who do you think they had teaching us how to night fight? Who? You think a stunt coordinator or somebody would be involved? No, no. They were asking Kyle McLaughlin. Wow. <laughs> star of this huge film, you know, who's got a, all this riding on his shoulders, and they're asking him to teach nine year olds how to night fight, you know, stage fight with knives. And I was like, I don't even at the time at nine years old, like, this seems really weird. I mean, Kyle's great. You would take the time to do it, you know? I mean, wonderful guy, very generous. Um, but I, even at the time, I was saying, gosh, this is an awful lot to ask him. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. Then. Um, comes the Mel Gibson movie Mrs. Sofal. How was making yep. that? Um, that was that was great. Um, that was uh, my brother and that was Harley Cross and then Trini Alvarado and Jenny Dundas were sisters. Um, Diane Keaton was wonderful. Um, as weird as as people make her out to be, without a doubt, but absolutely mm-hmm. wonderful. Um, I asked her to sign my autograph book at the end of the movie, like I ask everybody to, and she didn't but she promised she'd do something else and she did like two or three weeks after the movie was over i got a signed and autographed get well card from dan keith at my house weeks later can't make that up yeah uh, like i like like i had an operation or something uh, <laughs> um, i remember uh, there's a scene in the movie where i hop out to scare her the day before they're supposed to hang the middles and uh in the script, she was supposed to slap me, and she absolutely refused and could not do it. And I just got a heart shake instead. She just told the director flat out it wasn't happening. Um, but the, again, you know, working with Jenny and Trini um, and their families, the kids got real close. I worked with Harley a couple times. I think Harley played a younger version of me later. And I think Alex was my child. I want to. Um, so being in Toronto was great. It was my first Toronto experience. Mm. Um, Jillian Anderson was the director. It was. It was <laughs> apparently. It's really funny as you're younger, you know, I, you know what directors do, but you don't realize how much impact the director has on a project. Right. And uh, I think that was the that was the movie where they might have asked my mom to ask me to have less ideas about how shots should go at nine years old and just let the directors do their thing. <laughs> 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 I totally understand. Yeah. Um, I didn't. I, did, I never really interacted much with Mel Gibson. Matthew Modine, I remember as being an absolute prince. Ed Herman played my dad. Wonderful guy. Mm-hmm. Um. So yeah, really good experience. Toronto was great. How's working with Jennifer Dundas? She was great. I mean, uh, we were, we were all pretty close. I think on the set, um, mm-hmm. we had lunch together every day, and I've got a lot of great pictures. Of, you know, me and Trini, and me and Jenny, and all that in the group, and just a, a really, really, really nice girl. Yeah, she's a bucket list guest. I hope I get someday. Um, great. I'm a huge fan of Daryl. I grew up watching this movie over and over again. I talked to the co the co producer uh, Gabrielle Kelly a couple of years ago. Um, I couldn't find you at that time for the 35th anniversary, so I talked to her. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> what are your memories of working on that? Oh gosh, uh, Daryl was the best experience I ever had working in a movie. I mean, bar none. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful group of people. Um, Things I remember. I remember my agent um, facetiously. I think to this day, and Nancy Carson was my agent. I love Nancy. Um, mm-hmm. She, I think, at one point she threatened me that if I didn't get this movie, she was going to fire me uh, mm-hmm. as a client because the character was me to a T. There's very little acting in that movie. Um, I was as much a smart ass and smart Alec and foul mouth kid as you see in the movie. Um, so it was it was a blast to play. Um, Florida was great. Shooting in winter is not always great. You know, the baseball scenes we were doing in those little, like, pajama jersey t-shirts, it was probably 35 degrees, mm-hmm. um, which wasn't always ideal. <laughs> 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 but um, working with uh, Michael McKeon is probably my favorite person I ever worked with. Yeah. Um, just a prince of a human being. Um, he, I, I read, uh, I, I was a kid in the set who... Um, I, I very firmly believe that if, if they didn't need me, I needed to find a corner 
and tell somebody where I was going to be and stay out of the way until they needed me, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, he saw me reading a lot. He gave me my first science fiction book. He gave me A Childhood's End by Arthur C. Clarke. And uh, I still read tons of sci-fi to this day, and it's because he gave me that book. Um, you know, we got to go, we did three weeks in London, which was a huge experience in and of itself. Mm. Florida was great. Um, but it was just, it was the most family ass casting crew ever worked with. And the casting, you know, working with Simon Windsor, and you know, yeah. the first time we met him, he asked me to identify his accent, and I immediately told him he was British, because of course he's British. Um, and he told me I was wrong, and then I got very confused. So I think I ran through every other nationality known to man before he told me Australian, and then that made perfect sense that they sound the same. Uh, <laughs> but just wonderful. You know, I, I would show up on set every day, and there were daily hugs. You know, Cheryl Ann Martin, who became a pretty uh, accomplished director in her own right, was a production assistant on there. She might have been AD, I don't remember. Mm-hmm. Um, Donna, I don't remember her last name, but just, yeah, we, we were... We, our drivers every day, we were invited to their house on the weekends, you know, and, and having dinner with their families and things like that. Um, just it was that type of experience, you know, where you, you go, man, I, I would I would have loved more than anything for that movie to be successful enough to generate a sequel just to be able to spend time with those people again. But unfortunately, we came up against a slightly bigger kids movie that summer, and it just didn't quite pan out. Yeah, we're not talking about explorers. <laughs> no, it wasn't the uh, last one. You remember the one that kicked that kicked Daryl's butt? The Goonies. There you go. There's yep. the winner. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> I, yeah, they were all like in the same month. That was crazy. They, well, that's the way they, that they used to do things back. If you remember, every studio had their vampire movie at the same time. Every studio had their big kid summer movie. You know, it was just mm-hmm. sort of which one was going to come out on top. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, it wasn't about that year, but. Um, you know, like I said, I, I wouldn't trade that experience for anything in the world. Had, had, had Barrett Oliver done Cocoon already? <sighs> he had done Never Ending Story. Uh-huh. I don't feel like he'd done Cocoon yet. I have to go back and check. He'd done Never Ending Story before that. That was the one that he, he, he made his name on. And so, and he was funny. We had along great, you know, Barrett and I. I mean, we came from, uh, you know, he came from Los Angeles, so his fans was definitely much more... Um, into the acting scene and 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 um, than, than ours was, but uh, gosh, I mean, we we went out. I mean, I'll never forget. You know, you had a difference in, um, in how different the world is today as opposed to what it was like back then. We were in London for like three weeks, mm-hmm. and there was a day we weren't shooting. I'll never forget. I was eleven years old, and uh, myself and Barrett and his older brother yeah. took off for the day and went and explored London on our own. No cell phones. Uh, no nothing. I didn't know the phone number of the flat we were renting. Dolphin Square is where we stayed. Um, you know, but we got on the tube and went down, did the Tower of London. We got lunch out. We did all that and came home, you know, and like, you can imagine being in a foreign country with three kids, like 13, 11, and 11, taking off for a day on their own. Mm-hmm. It's crazy, but it was great. Yeah, it was also Simon Windsor's first American production, and then he went on yeah. to direct a lot of what are considered bad movies, like Lightning Jack and the Flipper remake, and uh, uh, Harley Davidson, the Marble Man. <laughs> oh my gosh, he was such a great guy. His kids, yeah, I can tell you so. I mean, there I have so many Daryl stories stored away. I mean, there's there's so much there. It's like, uh, uh, here's a secret from the movie, which maybe you've ever parceled out if you were a big fan or not. Uh huh. Um, I'll tell you the secret. I did not know how to ride a bike during that movie. Mm-hmm. And if you remember, there's some bike riding there when they're going off to get him at the lake when he lands the jet. Right. Or I'm sorry, when he blows up. Yeah, and if you notice, all the shots of Turtle riding his bike are from behind and really far away. So you had a stunt bike pl- rider. <laughs> <laughs> they found out about two days before we did that shot that I couldn't ride a bike. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> we are halfway through the movie. You know, I was like, oh, yeah, by the way. Next time I watch that, I'm going to know. <laughs> they, they, they ended up dyeing Simon's kid's hair color to match mine. Mm-hmm. Um, Ashley and Pip, and uh, they were the ones riding the bike from far away because, uh, yeah, they weren't going to get me up to speed in two days on the bike in the parking lot. Oh, my God. Colleen Camp plays your mom. She's so talented, and I heard she's a yep. force of nature. Uh, did you find that to be so? Absolutely. I mean, Colleen, Colleen was wonderful. Steve Ryan um, was passed, was a wonderful guy. Um, everybody associated with it. I mean, Mary Beth Hurt was, was great. Um, Colleen, but Colleen is my mom. Really warm, really nice, really funny. A lot of energy, a lot of energy. 
Um, and like I said, Michael was a prince of a human being, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. It's funny, I, I think back at how informal I was back then. You know, I remember being at the hotel and seeing some of the adult cast members who I recognized I hadn't met yet, you know, sitting around a table by the pool, and I just kind of got the nerve up and walked over and introduced myself, was on a first name base with everybody in a minute. Just so hung out the table talking to him, getting to know him. Um, <laughs> You know, Mike, Mike and I had a, had a friendship after for a while after the movie was done. You know, he mm-hmm. came to Chicago working on a movie with Michael J. Fox a few years later. Uh, oh, yeah, Light of Day. Night. What's that? Light of Day. Yep, yep. And uh, and then when he, they came through on the Spinal Tap reunion tour, I called his wife, left a message for him. He called me at my house, left me backstage passes. The next day, he calls me up, says, you want to go to a baseball game? I pick, end up picking, he and Christopher guest up, and we drive to Comiskey Park to watch a White Sox game. And um, it's just, you know, stuff like that. It's just, you know, I mean, what a blessed life I've had, you know, to have experiences like that with people, um, and, and people like that who, who made it worthwhile. That was, it was really great. Oh, yeah. To this day, I, I quote when uh, Daryl says to Mary Beth, next time I screw up, I'll watch my language. <laughs> <laughs> That was such a fun scene. It really was. I mean, I know it's literally like Turtle's big character moment and all that. And, yeah. Uh, that whole baseball game scene was, was fun. You know, it was, uh, uh, it, it's funny. It's like I watched Daryl and, you know, as we mentioned, you know, I kind of got in the business with, with zero experience whatsoever. You know, I'm mm-hmm. just kind of making it up as I go along. You're just playing a kid. Um, and, it's really hard to watch yourself. I think I, I don't know if many other people you talk to say the same thing or not, but you're your worst self critic. Yes. You know, it can be it can be hard to watch yourself on the screen because you're just picking apart everything you do. You know, and you're like, mm-hmm. Oh, I wish I hadn't done that. Oh, I could have done this differently. Oh, that was so stupid. Yeah. Um but but I watched Daryl, I mean, I was getting better by then. You know, it was like there's background reactions to things. There's reactions to things off screen, you know, like I, I I, I walk away from watching that movie, and I, there's things I would change. There's things I, I'm always cringy about, but I, I feel good about that character. I felt good about that movie. And, and, you know, when I talk to anybody who remembers that movie, they always generally have pretty positive memories of it, or at least they're afraid to tell me if they don't, um, which still works the same for me because I still in my head up here. It's a good thing. So. <laughs> <laughs> that scene where uh, David Wool is the awful teacher uh, in class. Oh, my God. He, yep. he he develops a twitch and Daryl imitates his twitch. <laughs> yep. I mean, he was so funny. Another guy, super high energy, so much fun. Yeah. Um, there was a I know oh, the other with the bullies in the in the in the classroom. Um, there was a fight scene in the library that ended up getting cut out. So we had stunt work for that. That was I mean a few days work, which was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just, there's so many good things about that movie. Gosh, it's, I don't know if you can hear it, and it, it's funny. I'll, I'll mention it to you now, and it'll probably ruin your experience. Um, <laughs> but the scene where I, I first meet Daryl when he's in the government facility, where mm-hmm. the two of us are just in his room, and I'm kind of walking in a circle around talking to him. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember that or not. but I, I do, kind of. Um, there's uh, They were having a terrible time because the sneaker that I was wearing made these horrific squeaking noises on the floor. Okay. Um, and, and it was screwing up the audio. And so I ended up doing that whole scene with wads of masking tape covering the bottoms of my shoes, trying to minimize the squeaking on that floor. You can put there's some bit in the audio. Um, but those are things you remember. You know, it's like, uh, I don't know if you, do you know where the, uh, the scene where I, we're, we're talking to Daryl through the computer the first time with Joseph Summer. Oh, yes. Um, the, the, do you know where that was filmed? Where was it? That was the control room at Epcot Center. Oh, okay. I mean, that was super cool, wasn't it? You know, yeah. and your old kid. You know what I mean? You show him like at Disney, you know, well after hours, we were shooting that thing all night long. Like, but we had to shoot obviously after the park had closed and everything else. So those were like three in the morning scenes for a ten-year-old. So crazy. Yeah, there, there's, there's so, like that movie. Just there's so many things that stand out. It, it, I could talk about it forever because it was just, it was that yeah. experience. Amy Linker played your sister. I tried to get her on here, and she she wanted to see questions first, and I never do that, but I, I wanted her on so badly that I sent her questions, and then she, like, changed her mind after being enthusiastic at first. Oh, no! Yeah, and it's okay. It's okay. But uh, the classic scene where Daryl plays the hell out of that video game in her room, and just before he leaves, he says to her, what, what what's a hooker? <laughs> it's classic. <laughs> And it's funny, I, I look back on that and like, 
and there's again there's little bits of dialogue they edit out to make because I mean some of the stuff I said there was actually pretty filthy for a ten year old, um, yeah. and they actually trimmed some things out you know to make it not quite as bad I think after the fact, um, but where they're talking on the on the walkie talkies and all that. Um, but Amy was wonderful. I mean, I I, I love Amy to this day, um, mm-hmm. and uh, it's she she was a great big sister. She was exactly like a big sister should be. You know, what I mean, um, she just just a, a great energy in your room. She's never been in. So really like her a lot. Then uh, you worked with Farrah Fawcett on Between Two Women. How was that? I did. That was um, that was a little different movie. That was. <laughs> That was a weirder shoot. It doesn't, it's funny, that was the one that probably stands out almost the least in my mind. I worked with Sarah, and she was wonderful with me, and Colleen Dewhurst was amazing. Um, but I don't know if it was just being in L.A., I don't know what it was. I mean, I remember, I remember more about being in L.A. and, and being my, my neighbor, who I mentioned earlier, like one of my heroes growing up, he actually stayed with me as a guardian on part of that shoot. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, it was, we were out there during the, uh, that was during the Night Stalker. I don't know if you remember Yep. Uh, Cole yeah, Jack? That was, that was, oh, no. Yeah. That, what's that? Not, Ramirez, right? Oh, Ramirez, yes. Richard Ramirez. Yeah, he's from my hometown, actually. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> that was going on while this was being filmed. So, like, these are the things I remember, you know, reading the news while I was out there. Um, mm-hmm. And Oshaka Khan lived in the hotel where I was at. We were playing with her kids all the time. Um, <laughs> anyway, besides the point. Um, so, Sarah was great. Colleen was great. I, I, like I said, that one stands out probably the least in terms of, like, making of the movie I don't know if I just didn't have as much to do with other kids and maybe that's why it stands out or anything else but um nothing I've never anything bad to say about either Sarah or Colleen they were both really really good to me um and, and fun to work with and, and you know never a problem on the set so it was, it was great mm-hmm. yeah Bridget Anderson from Savannah Smiles I love that movie uh yes. what, a, what a tragic ending she had yes yeah, that's that's a hard thing. Um, it's a hard thing. I, I, I wish I, I don't know what else to say about it other than that. Yeah. Um, wonderful kid, you know, wonderful kid. How about uh, Alex, The Life of a Child? Um, that was interesting in, in being a true story, you know, and, and getting to meet the kid that I played and getting to meet the girl they adopted after Alex had died and all that. Mm-hmm. Spending time with them was certainly an eye-opening experience. Um, Jenny James was wonderful. Loved working with her. Um, Bonnie Bedelia was great. Craig Reynolds was fantastic. Um, really nice dynamic on that. Uh, again, my second time in Toronto, so I had some experience in the city by that point. Um, a casting crew that just really, really worked hard to make that thing right, I think. Mm-hmm. Um you know, you know, back in the days of a disease movie of the week and all the rest of that stuff. So, you know, television movie, all the rest. Um, totally different part for me. Totally different emotional range. More challenging. Way more challenging. Because I was, I wasn't playing anything fun. You know, what I mean, I wasn't playing anything smart, smart Alec or, or anything else like that. Yeah. Um, so uh, much more of a challenge, you know, professionally than anything else I've done before. But um, next group of people. And then, ironically, you work with Bonnie Bedelia's nephew, Macaulay Culkin, on Rocket Gibraltar. His, his first movie. Uh, my last, yeah, that, I mean, you want to talk about cast. I mean, my gosh. Um, yeah. See, if, you, if you walk through the cast of that movie, I mean, for a movie that had like a $4 million budget, um, the, the people in charge of cast in that film deserved way more than they got. I mean, that was Macaulay Culkin's first movie. It was... Uh, at least early for uh, Angela Gothels. Um mm-hmm. Sarah Rue was in that movie, uh, Kevin Spacey, Bill Pullman, John Glover, Randy Conroy. I'm leaving millions of people out, uh, but just a really, really impressive group of actors. That was a very different experience, that movie. That was, that was, that was the most challenging shoot I had, I think, in terms of, it was, mm-hmm. it was, it was, it was challenging. Wonderful people. I mean, but just the uh, the, the way it, the way it unfolded was was more difficult. It was one of Burt Lancaster's last movies. I mean, that's got, that's that's got to be a huge highlight. It was again to meet him and interact with him and and have him be complimentary towards the work you're doing and all the rest. That I mean, that that means a lot. It really does. Um, yeah, I mean, but you know, he was older and, and it was harder for him. You know, what I mean, I mean, he was older and he had some big stuff and I think. He struggled a little bit sometimes on the set, you know, with, you know, there were some nighttime overnight shoots with some big speeches. And I honestly think it was hard for him. It's hard to put Burt Lancaster's not where he's working with eight kids. Mm-hmm. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I think I think that was a little challenging for him. Um, I don't know if you know the, the anything about the production of that movie or not, but I don't. Um, Amos <laughs> Poe wrote it, mm-hmm. um, and he was originally the director of the movie. And his, his daughter was cast as my sister in it, Emily Poe's in it. Um, and two weeks into the movie, they fired him. Wow. And then we all kind of sat around for a week in a hotel on Island while they hired Daniel Petrie. And then, you know, he comes on, and then now we're rehearsing again. So, you know, we did two weeks of work. We filmed half these scenes, and now we're starting rehearsals all over again. You know, which was, I mean, that's, that's a lot. It really is. And then, you know, it ended up being, you know, like, a, you know, you're working, it's a $4 million budget movie. Everybody there is working for scale. You know, mm-hmm. so it's, nobody's making any money doing it. Um, and you're living in a hotel on a highway in Long Island. You know, commuting to this beautiful house in the Hamptons every day. Um, and you're filming through late, you know, starting early August, you go through late October. Um, it was a lot. You know, it was, it was, it was a lot going on on that, on that shoot. Um, it still came out pretty well, I think, in the end. I don't know if you didn't notice any of that. It was hard. To, that's, that's one that I really, it's hard for me to watch self-critically. Because I know at that point I was 13, I was starting to be a teenager, I was more self-conscious about things. I really didn't feel like I'd let myself go performance-wise mm-hmm. the way that I could have and made made what I did in that better. Um, but yeah, I mean, the cast, like I said, I mean, uh, it, it's a who's who of people when I had just massive careers in, 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 in the industry after that was done. John Glover plays your dad. <laughs> He's always Wonderful good at playing guy. bad guys. Wonderful guy. And, and, and I, I have to give all the credit in the world to, to the girl who cast the movie again just because she got me that job. I think it came down to me and there was one other kid and she really wanted me to have it, and I think I wasn't quite getting enough energy out of the audition tapes that I had. And she just literally drilled me in a chair one day, and then she she actually stopped giving me my parts mm. and started giving me John Glover's parts. Because his <laughs> character was so high energy, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that, that really high-going producer. And she made me do his parts with more and more and more energy just to prove he could get out of me type thing. Um, and uh, that's what happened to the job, so I, I, I owe her big. She wanted me to get that part, and, uh, and that was the reason I got to have that experience. So, yeah, it was great. John Glover was a wonderful guy. Um, mm-hmm. Great as a father, great as a guy to work with. Um, you know, he, uh, I, I can forgive him for tackling me in the ocean in October multiple times. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah. So, can I, can I tell you, like, my favorite acting story ever of course oh my gosh um so filming that movie um at the end when we're shooting flaming arrows at mm-hmm. the at the boat right mm-hmm. um i don't know if you ever i mean have you ever shot a bow and arrow before no okay it's not easy like you gotta pull those things back really hard to make them go anywhere right mm-hmm. right and it's even harder when the arrow is on fire because the further that you pull that back, the closer that fire is getting <laughs> to your hand. Yeah. Right? And so we were having trouble. You, just, you know, you don't really need to shoot it that far to make it look good to close up, but it can't just fall out of the bow, right? Mm-hmm. And Emily, myself, John Bell played my brother, and Emily and, uh, and myself were the people shooting the arrows at the end of the movie. And I think if you look carefully, you'll, at the end, it's only me and John shooting. Although if, if you watch the long shot, you'll see Emily running around with the bow as well. And they ended up cutting Emily out because she just couldn't make the arrow look like it went anywhere. And there was a scene we were filming, and uh, it, was, uh, it was a dolly shot, right? So they were, it was John's shot, and then Emily's shot, and then my shot. And so the, the dolly starts down the tracks, and John takes the first shot, releases his arrow, you know, to the safe area where you can shoot a flame arrow. And uh, as they're rolling down the dolly, they get to Emily, and she pulls it back, and she tries to fire the arrow, and it just kind of flops forward, and it lands on Yost Vicano, the cameraman's arm, and sets his arm on fire. Right? Mm-hmm. Now, I see this, but his arm is on fire. And the first thing you want to do is yell, hey, your arm's on fire, or do something to help put it out. That's your instinct as a human being. Yeah. Yost, however continues to work and the dolly keeps rolling down the track towards me <laughs> so as I'm watching this happening every instinct in my body wants to scream wants to yell wants to run over help his arm anything else while well, other people are doing it but the other part of my body goes oh my god Yost's arm is on fire and he's still working which means I have to be able to keep working if he can work while his arm's on fire <laughs> 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 even though every 
everything in my body wanted me to stop, get mm-hmm. it out, whatever I got to do, I had to take the shot because there was no way I was going to stop working because my arm wasn't on fire. If Joe's could do this job while his arm was on fire. So. <laughs> process all of them. I don't know how I do a good job of explaining the, the, the intensity of the trying to process all those emotions while you're on camera. Yeah. It was a challenging moment in my career, I'm going to tell you that right now. <laughs> so what made you leave acting? Um, you know, it's funny. Um, so you go back to that time, and there, I like to say there was no WB back then, mm-hmm. right? Um, puberty didn't really exist in a lot of ways. You know, you were a cute little kid, or you were a brat packer. And there were a real small number of parts that came your way in between, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I'll go back to how I got into the business. You know, I got in a lark. I got in, I, I auditioned for the right movie at the right time with the right joke. Um, and I loved it. I loved doing it. I loved traveling. I loved meeting people. I loved interacting with people I interacted with. They were all wonderful. Um, but in the back of my head, I kind of knew that like, there were certain things I could get away with as a kid actor that I couldn't get away with as an adult actor. Mm-hmm. You know, as an adult actor, I was going to actually have to work at it like a craft. I was going to be competing against professionals as opposed to to kids, right? And that's a whole different level of commitment. Um, And as much as I loved it, I didn't feel like I would ever work at it as hard as I needed to to be successful as an adult. And so I kind of looked at it and said, you know, there's not going to be a whole lot coming my way over the next few years anyway. Mm -hmm. Is this the right time to step away and just go become a normal kid and go to high school or worry about going to college, you know, which is my... 98% 98% going to be my career path here or do I want to bust my hump and try and you know turn into somebody who needs to act for a living so I can do this as an adult and in the end I just kind of felt like the more realistic choice was to go, go to high school so I told my agent I was done she was supportive and my parents were supportive we always said it was you know it was time to go it was time to go so we left in our own terms mm-hmm. um, there's times I miss you know like I said the traveling and the people and the camaraderie that comes with making a movie yeah. um but I also know that, you know, I think I think I knew my range. I think I, I think I hit my spot. I probably got as much out of it as I could, um, and it was probably the right decision. You know, it's it's, it's hard to get up and leave your leave your friends for three months at a time when you're a kid repeatedly. Yeah. You know, my my friends are always wonderful coming back and all that, but there's a lot to be said for a sense of normalcy as well and having a regular growing up experience. Um, and so, as as much as I love it, uh, and, I, and obviously I like telling stories about it, and I had a really great time. Um, I, I think ultimately he was stepping away when I think it was probably the right decision. Mm-hmm. Yeah, did you ever audition for anything that became super iconic? I'm sure. I, 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 99% sure I was... No, I'm sure I auditioned for A Christmas Story. Mm-hmm. Um, I know I auditioned... One of my, my favorite audition stories is for, um, was for uh, The Wonder Years. Oh. And... And, and I showed up at the audition, and the, the, the casting director, whoever it was at the time, he just he said to me, I'm going to be really honest with you. He goes, I don't know why you're here. <laughs> 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 and it wasn't personal. He goes, this is nothing about you. He goes, but you're too old to play Kevin, mm-hmm. and you're too young for the older brother. Yeah. He goes, so I just don't really know, you know, what you do. So we can talk and, you know, we can do something. If there's a guest role or whatever, we can do that. But he, he was real honest with me about it, you know, from there. Um, uh, I auditioned, I had a, a quick audition for Cujo, which was the worst audition experience of my life. Because yeah. there were like 11 people in the room eating lunch while I was trying to work with somebody. No exaggeration. It was terrible. Walked out. I was like, dude, I don't want to work with those people again. Um there was a, I just remember laughing. There was a movie I think called Solar Babies. It was like all the oh. rollerblades. <laughs> yeah, I remember roller that. Skates. you remember that? Yep. <laughs> I'll never forget walking out of that audition, but as I was walking out, they stopped and go, Dan, do you know how to roller skate? And I just looked at it and said, no. <laughs> 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 they all laughed. But yeah, it was the first time I danced with that all day. It was a little shock. I did not get a call back to that. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was the stuff I remember. You know, it's like... Um, it's funny, going back to understanding directing a little more, like, uh, do you remember what we called it? I think it's called Little Monsters. Yes, with Fred Savage. And, and Howie Mandel, right? Yep. Okay, so I, I auditioned for that, and mm-hmm. I read the script, and I could totally picture the movie in my head. You know, it was very dark under the bed, and these cows, these cliffs, and things like that. Like, I could really envision this movie in my head, right? It was one of the first times I had a really clear vision of this, what this movie is going to look like. 
and I saw it when it came out, and it was so 180 degrees different than how I pictured it. I was like, oh my God, that guy didn't get this, because this is not how I pictured this at all. Not that it's a bad movie. It's just totally antithetical to, to the image I had in my head, and that's what really made me understand directing for the first time, was yeah. really was that movie, was how different one person's image of what was on a page could be than somebody else's. Um, so, yeah, I, I auditioned for a ton of stuff over the years. Um, the Christmas Story being the biggest one, Wonder Years probably being another one. Um, but that, that people would recognize now, at least Cujo. Yeah, no, I, I grew up on all those movies. <laughs> I know them pretty well. I figured, so yeah, I figured if anybody's going to pull Solar Babies out, it'll be you, right? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody I, else remembers that movie, but uh, you get major, major points for being able to remember that one. I love bad movies. In fact, uh, I, I was reading Mel Brooks was trying to reboot it uh, um, not too long ago, you know, because he was the producer of it, and... Uh, for whatever reason, it didn't happen. I guess it's just because it's a product of its time, you know? Well, and, and speaking of, and this is totally off topic, and I apologize for, it's for okay. hijacking the conversation in this direction, but I was having the conversation earlier. Like, I love almost everything Mel Brooks has ever done. Yeah. I love the old history of the movie, the history of the world movie. I love. Yeah. And I've just heard in the last day or two that there is a new history of the world yes. production that's going to be on Hulu in a month. Yeah, I, I, don't, it, I don't know where it's going to be, but I heard about it. And it, it simultaneously terrifies me and excites yeah. me because like, I'm so excited there's a Mel Brooks history of the world coming out, mm -hmm. but I can't imagine what they're going to let Mel Brooks get away with today. I, I it can't be very much. It, <laughs> compared it, to what he's getting away with some of these movies back in the 70s. It, I, I can't, I, I'm going to watch it because I'm excited because it's Mel Brooks, but I'm also going to be really, really scared. I can't even begin to fathom how this movie is going to go. I really can't. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <Okay. laughs> Who knows? Wait, speaking of Speaking of reboots, wait, I have, to, I have to bring this up just because I haven't heard anything in two years. Uh -huh. Did you see the story a couple of years ago? Somebody sent it to me and I posted it on Facebook just because it made me laugh so hard. Mm -hmm. Did you see that TBS was trying to reboot Daryl as a half hour sitcom? No. Oh my gosh. That's new to me. <laughs> you look this up. What's that? That's new to me. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to this. No, okay. it's the best thing. So apparently Tony Hale was attached to this to uh -huh. play Daryl. Right? Uh huh. It's in a press release. Um, as, 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 you know, as a grown-up adult, you know, Daryl, with all this sort of outdated, you know, hardware now, mm -hmm. trying to navigate, you know, a technologically advanced world, you know, when, when, when he used to be the, you know, the thing. And the, apparently the tagline to the show, again, not making this up, and it, it's a brilliant yeah. tagline, was, um, the boy that everybody wanted has become the man nobody needs in the reboot <laughs> who nobody asked for. <laughs> oh, man. I'm glad it didn't happen. I'm glad. <laughs> I haven't heard it about it in two years. Like, well, first off, this guy needs a better agent. <laughs> Second off, I'm, I'm so excited if they do it. <laughs> oh, man. Well, it's, it's, it's going to be nothing without you, so it's a good oh, thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, what do you got going on these days? Um, you know what? I'm I'm a dad, and I work, and I'm a soccer coach. That's good. Um, that's my life. You know, uh, I, I I I I've had an incredible life. I, I I've gotten to do so many things that nobody. You no, know, I, I would say that nobody gets to do this in real life. You know, yeah. um, I got to act in feature films when I was a kid. I worked. Um, and traveled with a Division One basketball team throughout my you know my, my later college years. I was at Arizona State, um, mm -hmm. and I got to. I tried to walk onto the team because I'm an idiot, five seven with tiny little baby hands, and I can't jump. But I was convinced <laughs> they needed me, and uh, they brought me out as a manager. And I got to travel and do a little practicing on the floor and all that, which was great. Um, I was an archaeologist. Uh, I worked. At, I was working on a project in Peru for three summers, working on five thousand year old pyramids and excavating those things. Um, you know, I've I've, I've I've had so much fun, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to do stuff nobody gets to do. Um, and I tell everyone, you know, if, 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 if I can give a anybody, it's uh, every experience I've ever gotten in my life is because we showed up and we said, yeah, you know, you weren't afraid to take that chance. Yeah. Um, my, my mom took me to audition. I called the Division One basketball coach in college and volunteered to walk out of the team with zero playing experience. Um, I, you know, I, I worked my way into a, a volunteer position in a museum until I could 
get interaction with a curator I want to work with, I get hired as, as an assistant, you know? Yeah. Just keep showing up, just keep saying yes, and, and it's amazing how many wonderful things can happen out of it. I, like I said earlier, you know, I, I know a lot. I know a lot of child actors, and they're all screwed up. But you are so well adjusted. God bless you, man. I'm glad that you're you're in, enjoying your life, and you've been handed a great deal. I, I have, and 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 also I'm thankful for for you and for reaching out and about this stuff. And uh, like I said, I, I I don't ever bring this up at parties. I'm not someone who will tell you what I used to do. It's not that impressive, you know. I got, yeah. I got a little experience that people don't get to do, but. I love the chance to tell the stories because the people I, I want, if, if one person I ever worked with ever hears this stuff and, and knows how much my experience with that meant to me growing up, it's worth it. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's amazing how far, you know, for how many years I've carried the gratitude of, of, of all those people working so hard to make my life better that, um, it's, it's really formed a lot in me in terms of what I can do for other people too. And, and uh, the fact that people like you appreciate the work and, and want to keep it alive to a certain degree and, and express, uh, express the appreciation for the work that you did makes me feel wonderful. You know, I, I love the fact that anything I ever did brought anybody any happiness whatsoever. So thank you very much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, Dan. You have yourself a great day and be safe out there. You too. Take care of yourself, okay? Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Well, there you have it. Dan Corkle, ain't he a cool dude? Oh, man, he is living his life, and he turned out pretty good. It's, it's so awesome. I love hearing those happy ending stories. No tragedy or nothing. Not like a lot of child actors out there. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past, because the present sucks. Later, dudes.